We welcome each other and we welcome you, O oh God. Make yourself known to us in new ways through our worship, our prayers, and our understanding of your word today. This is your day and we shall praise you. This is your day, O oh God, and we shall declare your name. This is your day and we shall worship our Savior and King. Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Turn and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. As you are seated this morning and we begin this hour of worship, a couple of real quick announcements. These are on your handout that you should have been given when you uh, entered this morning. And we want to issue a word of welcome to all of those worshiping with us in person this morning here in the sanctuary and those worshiping with us online as well. Next Saturday, Saturday morning, 8 o'clock, in Joy Hall, the men's breakfast will take place, our monthly men's breakfast, so make note of that. December 20th, which is a week from this Tuesday, that evening at 6.30, we are partnering with a sister church, Trinity United Methodist Church, over just down on Manatee, and myself and Pastor Robert, the lead pastor over there, are co-conducting a blue Christmas, and it's not just for mourning the loss of a loved one, it is for that, but any sort of loss or anything that is hindering the joy of the season for you or a loved one, so be sure to be a part of that, 6.30 on December 20th. December 24th, Christmas Eve candlelight service will be at 5 o'clock here in the sanctuary, and being that Christmas Day is on Sunday, someone said to me, uh, I know some churches don't have services on Christmas morning, but someone said to me uh, last week, it is Jesus' birthday after all. Shouldn't we be in church? And so we will be. It will be more of a, it will not be a traditional service as we know it. Uh, it will be more of a carol sing, and I'll have a brief devotion during that time, a short, uh, just a casual service, and we will celebrate the birth of our Savior during that time. At this time, I'll invite uh, Mike Tippett to come forward. He has a word for the congregation. Maryland to be with her, so I finally gave up and went. But I try to come back here as often as I can. This morning I brought a, a bag with about 10 t-shirts in it, 
that uh, reminded me of uh, the summer program for the for the children and all the so many different things that that we had and I am so grateful that this church exists and that it it's doing well it's beautiful and uh, I hope that uh, I'll be able to come back I, I'm gonna, I try to I try to go to Chicago every three months to visit my youngest daughter and I and then I come here to visit you guys and teachers and so forth uh, but I, I appreciate all the cards and letters um, that I got from you because I lost my daughter last month after having her with me for 36 years and we, we had made a pact that we'd never put her in a nursing home as long as one of us was alive but that had I had to put her in a rest home and in uh, so I don't feel too bad that her because her future was not, did not look good. But she loved everything that we did. We sat over there for 20 some years every Sunday. And when I sang in the choir, somebody sat down with her. And, uh, but anyway, thanks to you everybody, and I'll see you the next time I come. Would you stand this morning as we continue to worship God? Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Amen. You may be seated as our children come forward for a moment together. Last night I received a Christmas card from these two precious little girls. They're special to me. And we have a new face this morning. And her, Remy, Remy is with us this morning, beautiful little girl. When you're, when you're in the car with your parents or grown-ups and they come up to this, this sign that is red and, it's, it's, and it, says, it says, stop on it, right? So what, what should the grown-up do when they pull up to that? <laughs> Stop, right? It's a sign. Uh, when you're walking along with a grown-up down a sidewalk and you need to cross the street, what do you, do you just cross the street or do you wait, wait, what do you wait for? All the cars to go past. Do you look across the street and there's like an electric, what? Sign, yeah. Yeah, it tells you to wait, and then it'll tell you to walk, letting you know it's safe to walk. And you, you still need to look both ways, especially here in Bradenton. Yes, <laughs> yes ma'am, you're right. And when you come to church, and especially if someone's new here, we have signs all around the place. 
showing people where the sanctuary is, where Joy Hall is, where the restrooms are, all that sort of thing. So people who may not be familiar know which way to go, right? There's signs all over the place. Pastor Jim's going to read a passage of scripture to us this morning. And they come to Jesus and they ask for a sign. Is he, is he really Jesus? Is he really Jesus? And they're wanting him to show them a sign that he really is. And I guess I can kind of understand why they would. Because, like, if somebody new comes to church, or if I go someplace new, and I'm not familiar with where things are, if I don't know where things are, I like to have signs so I know where I'm going, right? I don't want to just wander lost out there. So I understand why they ask for signs. But Jesus really did show us a sign, didn't he? Yeah. And we look forward, we see signs of his coming when we celebrate. You know Christmas is two weeks from today. Two weeks. Yeah. And we see signs all over the place of his birth, don't we? And his presence in our lives. And especially in our hearts. So remember that, would you? We're going to light You remember a few weeks ago we talked about the Advent candle and how we light that every week? Do you remember what Advent means? Yep, Advent calendar, very good, very good. Advent means we're we're waiting for something. Yeah, countdown. That's a better way to put it. Yeah, countdown. We're counting down. We're waiting. We're waiting for Christmas Day for the birth of Christ. Would you guys... Join me as we light the Advent candle this morning. Yeah. I'll grab the candle. All right. So, two weeks ago, we lit the purple candle, and then we lit one last week. And this week, our scripture reference is Psalm 51, 12. This is the candle of hope. Let's read that together. Give me again the joy that comes from your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Let's pray. Lord, would you restore the joy of our salvation? Help us to be willing to follow you with all we have. Ignite in us a sense of joy that overflows out of our hearts. Let this holy joy be contagious and spill over onto the lives of those around us. Encourage our hearts with the knowledge that with you we can live in your perfect peace. No matter our circumstances, we thank you for the joy and peace you give. Amen. And so we light the pink candle this morning, the candle of joy. Amen. You guys can go. I don't know about you, but I love, whether it's one or a hundred, I love having children in the sanctuary. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up and sing as you are able. Lift up your heads, number 213.
Amen. You may be seated this morning. As we come to this time of prayer, I know we all come this morning with concerns on our hearts for ourselves, for family, for friends, for neighbors, for loved ones. And we have a prayer list here at Manatee Life Church of folks that are requesting prayer for various needs. And if you do not receive that list, you can get that in the weekly eLife. And if you do not currently sign up for that via email, you can do that. Just call Terry in the office and she can walk you through how to sign up for that and get that each and every week. Uh, keep the concerns of our brothers and sisters here at Manatee Life in prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we thank you today for your faithfulness and your mercy and grace. You're always there when we need you. You've never turned us away and you've never failed us. You've never failed to fulfill your promises to us and to your world. We pray for the needs of our people today. We've all come with individual and very personal needs. Maybe nobody on earth knows about the struggles and burdens they're facing. But you know, and you invite us to bring everything to you in prayer. So we reach out to you, and we know that you're already reaching out to us. We pray for many different kinds of physical needs, financial needs, emotional needs. Some need healing of relationships. Whatever they are, Lord, we bring those all to you. And as for us, bring us together under the banner of Christ. Bring us together for your name's sake. Let your people be joined one to another in true Christian love so that the world might know that we are your people and that you are our God. Won't you bring a great unity into our midst so that we might be one church of one mind and one purpose, which is to delight in you to your glory and for the good of all. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As our ushers come forward this morning to wait upon us for our time of God's tithe and our offerings, would you pray with me? Generous God, as we bring our gifts to you this day, we acknowledge that we have been given so much by your goodness. In this Advent season of preparation, we ask you to help us live in a new way, to walk in a new way to set ourselves on the path that leads to a closer walk with you, our example and our redeemer. Amen.
God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Christ, who's Lord of our bliss. With the Spirit, Holy Spirit, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. May be seated. And Mike Tippett, on behalf of this congregation, I know your family up north wants you there, but it would thrill our hearts if you decided to move back down here. <laughs> you are deeply missed. Amen. Your wisdom, your insight, and your personality is missed. I'm reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 11, starting with the second verse. An interesting encounter between Jesus and John the Baptist's disciples. Hear God's Word. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you have heard and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news of uh, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. That is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of a woman, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Something beautiful something good all my confusions he understood all I had to offer him was brokenness and strife but he made something beautiful of my And so now, Lord, we bring to you our life, our spirit, our mind, our soul. We lay before you our needs and our wishes and our desires. That in all that is said in this moment, we will be able to hear your voice. 
and respond. And it is my prayer that those who are worshiping online as well as those here in the sanctuary will not see this teacher, but will see the teacher. And will not hear my voice, but will hear yours. And we ask it in the name of Christ and for his sake. Amen. Amen. A jogger was out jogging. The terrain was a little treacherous. And he got a little too close to the edge of the cliff and tripped, and fell over the edge, and began to tumble down this steep cliff. And in desperation, he reached out. He reached out and tried to grasp hold of anything. And there, much to his amazement, there was an outcropping of a tree that had grown almost perpendicular to the cliff. And he grabbed hold of that branch, that tree, and began to cry for help. Is anybody up there? Is anybody up there? And he waited, and he cried again, is there anybody up there? And finally, a voice came. I'm here. What do you need? Send down a rope and rescue me so that I can climb back up, and he And the voice came and he said, well, I'm God. Let go and I'll catch you. And he thought for a minute and cried out, is there anybody else up there? (laughs) And that's exactly what we do, isn't there? Jesus has come. We celebrate his birth, the, the candle of joy of his presence, of his life, of our life that we have in him. And yet, even in the midst of that good news, we cry, surely somebody else has to be there or something else has to be there. Is there anybody else? Because I need to be rescued Turn to somebody and says, boy, do I need to be rescued. Because that's the reality of the life that you live and I live, is that we need to be rescued. We haven't fallen off of a cliff, although it might seem that way. We're tumbling. We're crying. Lord, come and help us. That's the $64,000 question, isn't it? Is there anybody... Can you remember when you were dating? Some of you will have to, that's ancient history. Way back when, when you were dating, and a person of the opposite sex walked into your life, and the first thought that crossed your mind was, is she the one? Is he the one? Could this, could this relationship materialize into something? Hmm? Or am I preaching to people who haven't had that experience? We always question, don't we? John the Baptist sends some of his disciples because he's in prison sends him to to Jesus to ask that question, are you the one? Are you the one we've been expecting? Are you the one we've wanted for and waited for and longed for and prayed for? Are you the one? Or is there somebody else coming along that is the Messiah? Now, on the surface, that seems like a strange question, doesn't it? I mean, because John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, He knew Jesus. He knew the stories that surrounded Jesus' birth. He had seen the deeds and heard the stories. 
of what Jesus was doing. Are you the one? Seems strange until we read the Jewish historian Josephus. Josephus says that in the time of Jesus, there were dozens, possibly as many as 30 Messiah figures that were out there in the countryside doing miracles and working signs. Jesus was just one more. And so the question is there. Are you the one sent by God, sent to our lives? It's an interesting question that is asked of every preacher, pastor, minister, when they first started out. Because when you are in your 30s and 40s, you preach with a little bit more enthusiasm and energy than you do when you're 80. (laughs) Trust me. It's happened to me, and it's happened to most of my colleagues. Somebody in the congregation will make an appointment, come in and sit in your office, and looks right across the desk at you and says a lot of questions. The first time it happened to me, I just, I said, okay. I finally stopped her. And I said, what's, what's behind your questions? Well, I hear what you say on Sunday morning. And I'm just wondering if you really believe. Hmm? And I had a bishop once at, at uh, St. Simon's Island who says, if you are worth the spit that made you, you will be asked that question. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive. And the only way you can present it is with a sense of enthusiasm and excitement. What excites you? And so I turn to you as members of this congregation and those who might be worshiping for the very first time and ask that very important question, what excites you? What motivates you? What gets you up in the morning with a sense of purpose and direction and life? How did Jesus respond? How did Jesus respond to John's disciples? Go back and tell them what you've seen and what you hear. First-hand knowledge. You can't be excited about something you haven't experienced. Right? And if you haven't experienced a relationship with Jesus Christ... You're not going to get excited about it. You're not going to tell anybody about it. You're going to keep it a secret. And so you spend a lot of time not introducing people to Jesus Christ, but a lot of people, a lot of time and a lot of energy trying to get them to come to church with you to introduce them to the church. Let me let you in on a secret. This is just between you and me now. You ready? The church has never, ever saved anybody. Let me say it again, because I don't think some of you believe it. The church, though we are of Jesus Christ, we are not Jesus Christ. The church has never, ever saved anybody So we spend all of our energy trying to get people, why don't you come to church? We marry them. We live next door to them. They are our children. Come and be with us at church. Come. And I like people to come to church, don't you? And I think we should. But being in love with the church of Jesus Christ is not going to fill the empty pews. What will? 
your experience with Jesus Christ, your testimony about him. It's, I had up in, up in uh, Temple Terrace, I had the, uh, at uh, Armwood, I think she was, Jan, who was the uh, head of the math department at Armwood High School. I thought about that when Mike was talking about teaching until his wife pushed him out the door and says, I don't want you here full time. Go, go, go substitute. And Jan, she says, when I sit down to hire a math teacher, I want somebody who has to struggle with math. They've had that experience of not knowing and struggling to understand. And she tutored a lot. She tutored my daughter. She tutored everybody that she had a chance. And those who struggled the most, she says, go get, you know it. Go get your teaching certificate and come back and I will hire you in a, in a heartbeat. You can't share something you haven't worked with. You can't share Jesus Christ unless it has become an experience that you have internalized. That's something you've just read about. And so the question that John's disciples were asking to Jesus, are you the one? And if you have that relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to say, yes, he is the one because this is the experience I've had with him. Amen? This is what I've had. I'd like, I'd like that little line that I had in the devotions this week where the gentleman said, before Christ, a mess. After Christ, a message. Don't you love that? That's a testimony. That's a reality. Questions. We have more questions than we have answers. We, we have more doubts than we have faith. We have more confusions than, than clarity and certainty. And it all boils down to our experience. Over the course of my ministry, there has been a, a, a push and a tug on my heart and on my mind. And recently, in the last month and a half to two months, it has resurfaced for obvious reasons, uh, but in various conversations, and that is between being called and having a calling. And when I first decided to get involved with my relationship with Jesus Christ, I was very envious of those men and women who could take a calendar and circle a particular date on a, in a particular month and said, on this day, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I've had those kinds of individuals in all of my churches. I wish I had that. And, and then there's, there's others who who just kind of grew up with Christian parents and grew up in the church and they didn't know anything other than that relationship with Jesus Christ. You know what I'm talking about? And they don't have that circle the date calendar experience. Now the home I grew up in wasn't Christian, not initially. But something drugged me to church. And through the love of Sunday school teachers and MYF counselors who made sure I went off to summer camp up at Leesburg, 
my relationship with Jesus Christ grew until I accepted him. Then I went, went, a, went away to seminary and I got introduced to the founding father of our denomination, John Wesley. Now, John Wesley was one of those individuals who uh, grew up in a Christian environment. His father was an Anglican priest in the Church of England, and his mother, Susanna, was a, a deeply godly woman who taught John how to read by reading the Bible. He grew up in that, and so when he became old enough, he made the logical choice to become an Anglican priest like his daddy. And through a series of all sorts of events, he, uh, he struggled with his faith. Having that experience, having those parents living in that household, he struggled mightily with his faith. He felt very lacking. And after a failed missionary trip to America, he went back as a defeated individual. And was encouraged to go to a Wednesday night prayer meeting at Aldersgate Church and where his heart was strangely warmed. That was the circle the date experience. See, John actually had both experiences, didn't he? Grew up through osmosis, came into an understanding of who Jesus was. But it wasn't personal. It wasn't, he didn't have that experience. And then all of a sudden, he had this experience at Altersgate Church. Now he was thrown into a quandary. What do I do? And if you read his journals, it was a long time from that Aldersgate experience before something began to take root in his soul. He struggled mightily, hungered mightily. And one of his friends by the name of Peter Bowler, and it's illustrated in his journal. Peter Bowler, who walked with John and lived with John and prayed with John and knew John's heart, said the following. John, preach faith till you have it, and then because you have it, you will preach faith. That's a marvelous line. Preach faith. And I always like to do a preach faith as if you have it, and then you will preach faith because you have it. And it was at this point that the fire was rekindled and the pulpits of Eng the Church of England were all closed to John because he was too evangelistic. He was riling up the people, getting them excited about their faith. And after all, we were the Church of England. We don't get excited about our faith. We just come to church and go through the motions. Really? It was at that point he began to have the experience And I like to make a little twist on it of my own conclusion is, is this. Live by faith until you have it and then live by faith because you have it. Now, I want to show you a picture to see if you know this lady. You know her? Who is it? And you would say, man, that lady has what? Faith. She's a walking or was a walking saint. Let me let you in on a secret. 
she struggled mightily with faith. And that statement I love about living is kind of drawn from her journals. She had more questions about God and about Jesus Christ and about the Holy Spirit and about the Bible than you and I have ever thought of. And you could see it in her writings, how she moved from the call. She knew she had the call. John Wesley knew he had the call. The call will come to you. It comes to you because of a preacher, because because of a Sunday school teacher, because of who your parents are, because of an aunt or an uncle, or because of the circumstances of your life. You have a call where you come to an understanding, a belief in who Jesus Christ is, but you haven't internalized it yet. It isn't a faith yet. It is simply a set of beliefs, simple statements, nothing more. But when you are in the grip of faith, i.e. John Wesley, Charles Wesley, Mother Teresa, you set the world on fire. That's the difference. And so John's disciples come to Jesus and says, are you the one? Or should we be looking for somebody else? Are you the one, or is there something else, anything else? And we try to go that route. I don't know how many people I've discussed this with that said, you know, I understand what you're saying about Jesus Christ, as did this lady over in Deland. I know what you're saying, but there's got to be an easier way, a simpler way. And so they turn, as she did, to drugs or an alcohol, or multiple affairs, or a rotating, revolving door of husbands, and none of them satisfied. And I said, it takes surrender. I heard a statement made some years ago that rings true to my experience. There is no such thing as an atheist or an agnostic. Think about that. Let me play around with that because there is a commercial running at has run off and on for quite some time. The spokesperson is Ron Reagan, and he speaks against everything you and I stand for. And he says in that commercial, as a lifelong atheist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, who's not afraid of burning in hell. You've seen the ad? And the person who said there's no such thing as an atheist or agnostic went on to say that they are at that point in their life because they have never encountered Jesus Christ. They've encountered people who believe in Jesus Christ, but who are not experiencing Jesus Christ in a living way, if that makes sense. They're not living out their faith. They want me to go to church. They want to convert me instead of just simply loving that other other individual. They're looking, as Ron Reagan is looking for, empirical knowledge, proof. And Jesus was saying to the disciples of, of John, the proof is in the pudding. Go back and tell John what you've seen and what you've experienced. 
And that's what, you're, that's what you're sharing. You're sharing the experience you've had with the Savior. And if you haven't had that experience, then you and Brother Jerry and I need to sit down and have a conversation so that you will have that experience. Because if you don't have the experience, you don't have anything to share. Amen? And we're talking about what you know, what you experience in your heart of hearts, that which you cannot, and that's the calling. A call comes in a time and place. There it is. A calling you never walk away from, no matter how old you get or how many times you retire. You cannot ever walk away from it. Because it pursues you. It's there when you wake up in the morning, and it's there when you go to bed at night, and it's there even in your dreams. It's there. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Read it with me. For we live by faith, not by sight. Faith, F-A-I-T-H. I've given it to you before. I'll give it to you again. F-A-I-T-H, right? Faith. You need a quick definition? This was from a Scottish Presbyterian evangelist, which kind of in times is an oxymoron. I'm bad, aren't I? (laughs) F, forsaking. A, all. I, T, trust. H, him. The question I have for you is have you forsaken all? And do you trust him totally and completely? for every moment of your life because we live by faith not by sight and if that faith becomes alive in you you will win all the more let's pray gracious God to you we give praise and thanks for the witness the faithful witness of people like John Wesley and Mother Teresa. And we pray earnestly for all the Ron Reagans of the world who are looking for some answer other than the answer you have given to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to be committed and faithful followers of the Savior where we abandon everything except our trust in Him. And we give you the praise as we give you the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let us stand as we sing together the closing hymn. What child is this who lay to rest? It's on Mary's lap is sleeping. Who angels greet with anthems sweet? While shepherds watch our keeping. This day. Christ the King, to whose shepherds guard and angels king. Haste, haste to bring him all of the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean a state? Where rocks and ass are feeding, good Christians fear for 
Christians never looked down. They always looked up. Why? Because they anticipated Jesus coming on the clouds of glory. You look down, you're sorrowful. You look up with anticipation. So look up and go in peace and go in love. And may the peace and the love of God be so real in you that everyone who comes near you will get soaking wet with the love of God. And I'll meet you over in Joy Hall with a cup of coffee and a cookie. Amen and amen. <laughs>